Okay. <clears throat> That's time for some time. Okay. So, uh, before we start quickly, so how many uh, are already you know started learning the Go, Roland, some experience with writing code and all that. Okay. Cool. Awesome. So, uh, I'm Sudhakar and uh, I'm currently working the as a tech architect in Dhaka Labs, and I was uh, with Thoughtworth before, a couple of three years before, and uh, I'm also, you know, a part, uh, I'm taking care of uh, Sport India, which is one of my most successful <coughs> colleagues. And it is live, and then, uh, yeah, it's kicking. And uh, yes, so before uh, we go into the talk, right, I want this to be more, uh, you know, discussion uh, instead of being a monologue. That way, please feel to ask questions and. Uh, more of more what actually I'm uh, presenting here is mostly based on what uh, I started learning, you know, and I also have some experience with Erlang. Uh, anyone has uh, some exposure or understanding of Erlang, you know, Elixir, Erlang, VM, VM, VM? Okay, awesome. Right. So uh, when with that experience, when I started, uh, you know, learning Go, I was able to see some patterns, the commonalities, mostly around concurrency, how these two handle concurrency and. Uh, no, and so that uh, triggered me to say, okay, maybe if I have uh, talk about that, and this is what I am going to present now, right. And uh, before we proceed, uh, so parallelism, right. So there is a difference between uh, parallelism and concurrency and there is a very good uh, talk by Rob Pike, you know, and, uh, you know, it says uh, concurrency is not parallelism. So if you look at that, uh, more or less what I will be talking is on the same lines. But for those who don't know, you should watch it no matter what because I cannot go that detailed with and uh, that's a very good video actually. And uh, so, what is parallelism? Multiple things. Okay. Yeah. So, I think the contrast between concurrency and parallelism would be parallelism truly means running things um, simultaneously. Simultaneous, right? So, say Java, so I mean, someone, any done, anyone who are done with uh, thread locks and programming, they call parallelism, right? So, you know, uh, usually the moment you have parallelism, what we are effectively saying is, okay, you have a sequence of steps, a program, right? But you wanted to run this program at the same time, n number of times, right? Meaning, so that is where you come with, okay, parallel context, multiple threads. The same program will run at the same time, start, and then that's where the start, right? So, the same program is running as multiple parallel contexts, right? So, that we call this parallelism, and obviously, each one it takes its own progress time, you know, other based on factors, variables, and all that, right? But that is parallelism, have that in mind. And uh, the moment there is parallelism, there will be this, uh, you know, sharing of memory, right? So, that is where logs, mutexes, and all this comes, right? How we implement, uh, you know, logs, and of course, mutex, all this. So, the basic idea of parallelism is, okay, so all the processes does not know the about. Processes, I am using it very loose, basically it is execution context. All the context does not know about the status of other context, right. And if there is a common memory shared object that needs to be accessed by multiple threads, there should be someone, you know, some gatekeeper here to say, hey, okay, stop, because this can access only one. At a given point in time, we only one thread. So I'll stop, say for example, this thread here, and then let this thing continue, and then I'll let you in. So the moment you have a shared memory, the problem of having a gatekeeper arises, and that is where all the loss. And it is as you know, someone who had tried programming uh, in this uh, paradigm, right, knows how hard it is because it defies our natural way of thinking, right? The, uh, thinking parallelly will not come very easy for us, and I know it will create a lot of bugs which is hard to debug and find because it is not, you no, know, it is like will not be reproducible that easily depending upon, you know, what runs when at what time, right. So far with me, good. So this is with, uh, you know, we are talking about parallelism, right. Concurrency. So what I, what, you know, Rob Baker, what concurrency actually means, right. So here, so this is one task, right. So, this one task could do multiple things, it will have multiple functions and we call the other function, it will go to other things and then it will do a sequence of steps, right. So, concurrency effectively says, will you be able to break them into separate tasks that run one after the other, right. So, that one line, if you can think of solving the same problem in a concurrent way, you will try to break them into smaller tasks, 
right? So there is still handholding, right? One has to give handover, uh, more or like think of it like Unix pipes, right? You have small programs, but they will have a handholding. So one program output becomes the next program's input, right? So that is where uh, you are trying to solve the way of thinking itself is different now. So how you solve the problem when you think in a parallel context is very different from how will you try to solve the same problem in a concurrent context. Right, so that is why it's like how you, you know approach the problem itself is different here. It's not just the technology or the you know, VM or the tools. Right? It's also how you look at solving that problem. Right, so the moment you are able to break a, a work, you know, into concurrent tasks, then it is very easy to run it parallel. Right, so you still can run concurrent ta tasks parallelly, and this is what you know the uh, concurrency is not parallelism. The one hour of video of Rob Pikes will explain it, you know, in a more uh, concise and more effective manner. Right, just to put that context there, right? So take this example. So there are there is a post box and there's a lot of letters. Right? If you wanted to run uh, the the task is very simple. So if the guy has to actually take uh, the post from some you know there's a pile of posts, take it and put it in the post box, that's all. Right? If I wanted to do this, you no, know, parallelly, what I'll do, okay, I'll have two people, two um, uh, two uh, two, uh, two uh, lot of mails there and then they'll actually run back and forth all the way to the post box. This is the uh, parallel way of solving the problem. But you will still have uh, contention there, right? Because there is only one post box. At one point in time, both cannot put the hands and put it. So there should be some, you know, handshake between both the processes. Say, okay, hold on, I'll put it and then you put it. So that is where the contention happens. More or less, this pattern, right? Do you have a shared object? The moment you have a shared object, you should have some handshake that needs to happen. Right? The same problem, if I wanted to think it uh, concurrently, how will I think it? So this is the problem, right? I have some letters, I need to put it in the post box. And I know I have two folks. Uh, this is, I'm running them parallelly, so they're, just run, they're doing the same task, two times, running two people. Correct, right? So the moment we do that, so what we did is we effectively broke the problem, saying that, okay, so, but this guy will not worry about going beyond this pipe. And he is responsible to take it from the other file. Now, if you look at this problem, you effectively avoided a lock scenario, locking scenario. Why? Because the post box is still accessible only one way, right? There is no handshake that needs that is needed there, or there is no locking mechanism that is needed there, right? So this uh, is, you know, at a high level, this is what the uh, you know, concurrency and the you know, parallel way of thinking and concurrent way of thinking is the differences. Okay. And uh, yes, so now we know what is uh, concurrency and parallelism. So let us take uh, what communicating sequential processes mean as per uh, Hoare. Hoare uh, you know, had this idea in 60s and he actually had written books and papers. So paper and there's also a book. And, uh, if you ever uh, are brave hard enough, you should try it because I failed. There's a lot of mathematical equations and, and axioms to explain his idea in a mathematically provable fashion, right? So, but there are you know, alternate, many interpretations of that so that it's easy for our uh, mortal humans to understand <laughs> when we are mortals, but yeah. So, the idea is very simple. So, you have a lot of sequential processes, right? See what, these are all sequential processes, right? How will you make them communicate? know between them in such a way that you can concurrently get them doing things right so that is the idea more or less right with CSPs and uh, this is the idea with which uh, Golang was also like uh, Golang was uh, using the CSP pattern to implement the go routines channels and all that uh, Erlang also does the same it uses CSP so Erlang is more closer to uh, the CSP why because uh, CSP says that every process should be identifiable, but in Golang, no, when the moment you create a Go routine, you cannot, uh, no, reference to that, there is no reference to a Go routine. So who had uh, uh, tried uh, playing with a Go routine? Has anyone created a Go routine and tried to understand what is a Go routine in Go? Okay. So uh, I'll also show some demo to exa explain that. So Go routines are usually a separate uh, functions that can actually run, you know, uh, in parallel. Right, so I'll uh, try to explain what it does with a demo. So yeah, this is what uh, CSPs, right? So you have uh, processes 
and channels a way for the processor to communicate or to share the data right a process is not a os process please don't think it as os process threads no it is not that process is some unit of work that sequentially executes right at that level is what he means as process and uh, channel is the one that actually helps you to you know message pass or communicate between two disparate processes and uh, csp explains lot of patterns right um, so uh, the moment you see it uh, you you might think that this is more like pub sub right you publish data one side and you, you know subscribe and get the data on the other side in some other program but it is not there is actually a difference very important difference like say for example this is the main difference right they are synchronized uh, what i mean by synchronized say um, take this example so i have a uh, a is a uh, going to generate some data for others to consume okay and uh, b c d they are all consumers right they are waiting to get some data from a the moment a is going to send some data right uh, csp says that so it's synchronous meaning a will wait it is blocked it will not go beyond that the moment it puts a data in the channel it will wait there till that data is consumed right it's not like you no know, it just put the data it's not like a uh, you know uh, like how erlang or akka scala does that right you just have a, a message box and then you put the message and go it is not that way so it's synchronous and uh, say the one message either a b or c only one can consume it so it's not like a you no know, publish publish the whole board it's not like that the moment b consumes it b will proceed its execution and c d will start it will still wait to get some input so that is how they are actually doing this a synchronized uh, you no know, handshake between the different processes right so you get it clear yeah so we'll go to uh, the golang implementation so this is what you uh, know roughly what uh, communicating sequential processes explains right so you have process you have channels and there is a mechanism for the processes to communicate among themselves using channels and they are all synchronized that's a that's a very simple idea right but this simple idea along with implementation of concurrency how it can be done right so in golang we'll first start with uh, golang how it is done so go routine right uh, what is a go routine it's like a co routine you the co routines are like very lightweight processes which has its own stack memory allocated and then they're like very and you know, they are very cost effective to create so you can actually create millions of go routines right it's not like a heavy like threads or operating system processes they are not so a single thread os thread can actually run uh, not at the same time of course but it can run or it can maintain so many go routines like no hundreds and thousands of go routines and they'll actually switch across go routines right so they are private stack so every go routine will have its own stack execution stack and uh, they are small so they start with very small memory think of it just 4kb and say you have 1gb of ram you could create so many go routines right at the same time and they all stay in the memory and uh, they also grow and shrink based upon the complexity of your routine right if you're doing more you will your stack size will keep increasing and will automatically go down right and uh, as i said uh, there is no reference the moment you create a go routine with a go uh, keyword before a function that's it you cannot refer that back you can refer that okay but oh how you do that maybe briefly okay but uh, what will it be side effects will there be side effects the moment you access this references and yeah there is no guarantee for it oh it might become can be thrown away right but the goreden once it's complete okay interesting okay and uh, channel so uh, so in golang channel is a first class citizen it's a primitive right you can actually create a channel and then you can say what type of data it gets in right and uh, so it's think of it like a pipe right that connects different go routines and they are addressable so you can get a reference to a channel and that's how you can control the execution flow across go routines right and uh, they are also synchronous so they are blocking the moment you put something into the channel uh, it has to be taken the one one leaf it is taken the one that act the go routine which put it will continue as i shown in the example right so these are the two uh, entities that actually help us to come or build concurrent programs in golang you have go routine and you have channels that's it right so like the csp if you, you know translate this csp it also had the same right a process which is a go routine and a channel okay so this is what uh, happens right so there is 
uh, a process A, a go routine A, and there is a go routine B, and uh, go routine A is doing some processing, pipe bar on the top, and uh, there is a channel in the middle. So it is actually publishing something into the channel, putting some data into the channel. The moment it does that, it cannot proceed any further till this is taken away. Right? So nothing happens here. So if you notice here, right, you will uh, see that this mechanism will allow you to not access this memory by more than one go routine at any point in time. Right. So there is no way that two go routines can access the same memory at the same time, as long as it is in the channel. And channel is the only communication between this and go routine. Right. This way, you don't need actually a lock. Like how we are you know, doing the in, in parallel programming with object locks and release and all that in Java, you don't need that because of this mechanism that is defined or that is proposed in the C in CSP paper by Bob. Right. So this way, you don't need locks and it actually makes it far easier for us to program without locks, you know, in a concurrent style. Okay. So far so good. Any questions? No questions. Yeah. Too silent mode. Yes. Correct. <coughs> so, it's copy by yeah, copy by value. Yes, it's copy by value. So, So see, the moment you say it as a copy by value, right, you are saying, why? Because the go routine, as I told, it has its own stack, it has its own uh, memory allocation, right? So then the moment you copy it, the value it takes into its stack. And uh, so that way, the thread can also swap and there is no problem with contention. The question was that, what are the semantics of Exactly. No, it's not shared object. So they are actually pass pass a value to that thing. The value is copied and stored in the channel. The channel actually has few semantics. So the first thing first of all, actually you have a few semantics on that. And you can also have buffered channels. So yes. Actually when you create a channel, they are not buffered. So you have to put one item, take the other item, put the other item actually. So there can be only one and the and buffered channels are asynchronous but by default channels are synchronous. Yeah. Yeah. Buffer is actually the queue. Right. But uh, usually the channels default they are uh, the moment it is blocking right you understand the moment you put it there is nothing that can happen from the side. Right. So uh, you someone has to take it out so that you know, next object can be put. Right. So you can usually channels hold one value. You put one value. Yes. Sorry? It's not 
but I'll, I'll come to that part. So how you know, OS threads are mapped to GoRoutines and what does Golang do, right? And there is a stark difference in that aspect because when you compare that with Erlang, Erlang has a virtual mission, but Go does not have a virtual mission, right? It just uses operating system threads and processes, right? Hold on to that, I'll show, I'll depict it better to explain how you know, threads, how context switching happens, how scheduling happens and all that. <laughs> Okay, so we're good or any other something? Okay. Sure. Right. So, big groups are used to say, for example, when you start off Goro, you don't know when they're going to be. So, Goro is going to make some mistake with the call. Is all yeah, so you would wait till say you make 10 mistakes. Right? You want to do after 10 of them are complete, rather than five more times. You will say after 10 of them are complete. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like promise dot com. It's all collected. Yes. What you want to do with the Wait group only allows you to coordinate completion. I mean, it's essentially why you group. So, how many things do you want to wait on? Yeah, like a single message from my to Okay, so I'll quickly show a small demo with uh, you know, how the synchronization happens and the channels and all that. So for that I have a very simple uh, node uh, endpoint running. So what it does is, uh, you no, know, it responds after some time, a number, basically it's the same time it waited. It's just, just an endpoint, so it took 5 seconds and it's random every time. Uh, We'll give a different. Oh, it cut. Sorry. It's cut. Now it's better. Oh, no. Right. Okay. So this is the endpoint that I'm going to use. Once it's small. Okay. Yeah, so it will take that much seconds and then it will respond that number, that's all, right, it does not know anything. And uh, we will see the program, right, it's a very simple program, I am just trying to show this, you know, how the synchronization happens and how you can actually have that you know, hand checking and all that. So here, what do I have, I am just uh, making a call, HTTP GET and I am getting the response and I am, uh, why don't I do this, I will not even worry about things. Okay, here it's a very simple code, right? I'm making HTTP GET call and I'm getting the response and I'm printing it with seconds, that's all. So, say for example, I'm going to run this. Wow, oh, we got lucky. So, it took four seconds. So, right, it took four seconds and after that you just got the response and the program is it, right? That's it. It didn't do anything more than that. Say for example, I'm doing uh, the same. Now, if you notice, there are no go routines. I'm just running plain, simple one routine, the one function, and I'm doing one after the other, and then uh, I'm just printing those values, right? So the execution happens sequentially, sequentially, right? One after the other, it just printed 
one after the other and then uh, so this is all sequential no confusion here so like uh, any other programming language any other code right so say for example i wanted to make all this as go routines so that i can wait on the channels and at the end i'll say okay now all done i have collected some data right so let me just create a channel for this i'll have uh, bear with me i might uh, make some syntactic errors so i'll create a channel uh, called done and then uh, i'll convert this to uh, say function right and then i'll immediately execute that and then this will make it as a go routine <coughs> and uh, the same i'll do for the others also Uh, but i'm not uh, so here i'm initializing the response object here i don't need to i am um, yeah <laughs> don't think of no. cleaning up this code but okay. <laughs> i'm just showing a demo here <laughs> just to get the idea right. yeah i could <laughs> or extract it as operate <laughs> function <laughs> that's what you're saying okay so what happened Oh yeah, but it's a function right now. So that is why it is same now. Yeah, you're right. Mm. Okay, because this is not used. Assume that I'm uh, for now. I just run this code, and what is expectation? It will not print anything. It will execute immediately. Why? Because I started all this uh, Go routines, but there is nothing that you no. Know, the moment the main Go function executes. It exits and then it will not wait for the others. Sorry, without channels. But definitely something. Definitely it's like you want to have a method which you want to execute. <coughs> just like this other function. Exists. It's later. You just defer the execution. Right, but we can actually do wait for it by using a channel. Right? The simple way is okay. I'll have a channel, and then here. Uh, once after I print it, I can say, okay, I'll just pass a boolean to it. Hey, I'm done here, right? So I'll do the same for the other go routines also, right? So now the what channel will have. You will pass and done to the function and then. Like you will pass a channel to a channel go routine. Like oh, interesting. And this will actually, ha you know, what memory leak? There will be a memory leak with this. Not right? just the channels are not that big of an issue, but mm. be very careful when you use go routines. I Inside mean, uh, yeah, yeah, definition. Yeah, yeah. So you know, when, when you want to close on something, and especially during go routine, when you close on something, then you don't know what your life cycle of having to do. Okay. Hmm. So this is just. So you are only waiting for one of them to complete. When the first one completes, the name will exit. No, it will not exit now. Sorry. Okay. When so, the first one completes, the name will exit. No, I'll show you. So I want actually all the three to run. So what happens is when this go routine executes, it is going to put this into the channel. Correct. And uh, it, the second go routine, uh, if you follow right, it will not be able to put this into the channel. Even if it is complete, why? Because as we said, there can be only one object in the channel has to be clean, you know, taken out for the next one to be put, right? But this outside outer go routine, because of this code, the moment the data arrives, it will be able to take it out, right? But, so that means we should have two more, so that all the three completes, and then all the data from the channel will be taken out, and then the function can execute safely. I mean, exit safely. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Function pointer. You can pass the pointer. So this is just an example. I like copy paste it, so it's easy. But I uh, know uh, I don't want to do refactor session here. <laughs> That's no, I think it makes sense. I'll yeah. Once I'll show it, and then. Yeah. Yeah. Can we also do uh, like extend all the 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 yeah. yeah. See, you think of it right. This is you, you, uh, this function right. How was it executed? It is also run uh, run as a go routine, right? No. Uh, technically, uh, your main doesn't run in a go routine. Main is the first concept, uh, and then so it has its own stack. So when you 
call another tour team, it gets its own stack. But you can also launch another tour team from another tour team, and that will also get its own stack. No, but main is still a Goro team, right? How can it not be any other? Because there is only one mechanism of executing it's in Go. Yes. 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 So it's technically a Goro team. Just that no, you don't define it as a Goro team. Right. Mm. Uh, no, Not necessarily, that's, that's a execution uh, script. Yeah. Okay, but we'll see what happens now. I don't think so. It is, it is yet another Gorin, but maybe I should uh, check further because that's what my understanding was. You know, Wagni is having doubts, maybe I'll double check. <laughs> you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, we'll see. So, for example, okay, I'll build it because I wanted to time it. So, I know, right, uh, whether uh, it ran concurrent, it ran parallelly or it, like it wait, sequentially it ran. So, total time is 5 seconds. So, it took the maximum of the time. So, because all the three are running in parallel, so the four program to execute, the maximum of the one will be the total time, right? Yeah, concurrently. Uh, concurrently. <laughs> <laughs> True. Wow. Just all fine now. Now you should have. <coughs> okay. So, that's the thing. So, all are running concurrently and then you will have the maximum time taken for the whole program to exit. Right, say what happens if I do this, you get this, say for example I don't have this, now what will happen? You get an error. Is that so? It will not stop, I, that's what I guess, it will block. And uh, so anyway, uh, here you are not waiting, so it actually will exit, only two will run. Do the other. Add one, two, three. Just to say that, hey, it's not necessarily that first one and the second one. Okay. So it's more like uh, you might have microphone, right? Then we are not waiting for it. Correct. Yeah. It will not wait. So the main program will not wait. The moment it gets two responses or two data from the channel, it exit. So we don't know what will happen to the third one. I mean, obviously, the output of that is not that right. It exit. Yes. Happen. Yes. Exactly. We don't. I mean, what yeah. Do yes. Right, so now if we run it, so two things completed, oh, two things completed and the third one we will not wait. So we will invert it, right, say I am waiting for three uh, data from Right, I mean whether the scheduling has happened even before the main it's go routine has exited. So, I mean that will be like it's not deterministic. Not yeah, it's not deterministic. Yeah. You might see all patterns. <laughs> that is the whole point. So, that is the concurrent thing, right? All the three will start. Could be anything. So, say take this example, right? We saw first and second running now. Not necessarily it's always first and second. So, it started second. with second now. Second and third, right? Yes, I'm not waiting for all the three. So we'll invert that, right? So what happens? I'm waiting for all the three, but one of the function has not put anything into the channel. Now what will happen? Yeah, it will never exit and will wait indefinitely, right? Because uh, the as we said, right, it's a blocking. The moment this function is going to put something into the channel, and this first line will take care of taking it out from the channel. And the, this guy is also going to eventually complete at some point in time. He's going to put the data into the channel, right? And this guy will take the channel out, right? So the main function or main go to execution will come to line 34 and it will wait there. It will wait there because it's blocked till something gets put into the channel again. It could be by any function actually. So it, here also it can put twice and all that. But the point is, right, the channels are not tied to a go routine. As long as you have reference to the channel, you can just you know, put data into it. So, we'll just check that quickly. So, 
So you got first, third, and then that's it. So it'll wait. Got it? Clear? Yeah. Oh, but he didn't write to the. Yeah, I didn't write to the. Oh, he didn't. Yeah, I didn't add. He just printed it. How's it coming to print? Okay, so I'm going to kill it. Right. So this more or less uh, is what I wanted to show with channels and road things and how do they you know connect and interact with each other. You're good. Any other patterns or combinations you want to try? What would you do? Like <laughs> I mean, you can use the same pattern to actually the moment uh, something is crashing, you can catch it and then uh, put it to a. No, oh, you don't want to wait for more than 10 seconds. Like, like for example, yeah, clearly. Yeah, yeah. So either you forgot to do that, or the server just you know, is not responding. It's not doing anything. Yeah. Correct. But why do I want to? Then you should. The moment you time time out, you should have a code that will actually time out and add something into the channel. Right? Yes. What happens if that is buggy? Right. I mean, it's much like a default case. How do you select? Select and you have multiple channels inside. Yeah, yeah. But what if there is no data that is coming to the channel? The whole point is no, no one is putting into the channel. channel. Can have another channel which doesn't work. Only if there is an exception, it has to be put into that yeah, channel. Yeah, sure. Maybe I'll complete that and then uh, I'll give it yeah, to you. Yeah, so in a sense, <laughs> what you do is uh, you have a timer created, um, and that timer actually becomes a channel. So you can select on the one channel or the final channel. Okay. So I am getting signals that it is uh, time up. So what I'll do is I'll take a couple more minutes and then this guy took all my time. So <laughs> no, with this talk, not bit questions. Sorry. <laughs> so I'll just show one thing with related to one of the questions that I got. Right? How it actually you know handles go routine spreads and how what is it, how it is connected and all. Uh, and also I have some a brief I'll touch Erlang because the whole point is I wanted to compare Go, but <laughs> we are done with Go itself. So what Erlang does, it's more or less the same, right? Erlang calls what we call as a go routine as a process, right? Once again, it's a very small process. It's not OS processor. Right? It's like it's a very small execution uh, uh, entity, like how we think in Erlang. Uh, sorry, uh, how we think in Go as Go routine. And it also has a private stack, and it is small. It has the same patterns. It stack rows and strings and all that. But here, every process has a process ID, right? So you can interact with the process by sending a message to it as long as you have handled the process ID. In Go, we don't have that. We have only channel references, right? We'll send data in the channel. But here, I you know Erlang does it in a different way. It has process ID, and then you can connect to that, and it's asynchronous. Because so this follows the pattern of inbox, right? So the moment you put anything, uh, you find the process, and you do send to that some data to it. Now it's asynchronous. You will not wait like how Go um, GoLang is waiting for someone to take the data out of it. It is not that way, right? It's asynchronous. So your patterns, right? How do you write code? Uh, will vary very differently. Will change, right? Your patterns of execution, your the way you think about it, will change. No, because of its asynchronousity, right? And so this is what I wanted to show, right? Golang, as I was telling, right? Golang does not have a virtual machine, right? Like Java or even Erlang. Erlang is a Beam VM, but Golang does not have it. So what it does is, so it will actually use the operating system threads for its scheduling, right? So here, what I'm trying to depict is, right? Golang usually suggests, okay, how many cores you have in a CPU? That many threads is the uh, best, you know, a good uh, uh, number to have for your uh, Golang. When you start the program, right? So, and what it does is, it has a lot of go routines created, and the scheduling will be taken uh, by in the OS threads. So, what that means is, right? So, as uh, we know, a process has a lot of threads. OS process has a lot of threads, and they share memory. So, the memory is shared across threads. That is why we have this problem of parallelization, and you have thread lock and locking the objects that is shared across the threads and all that. And here, the same thing, but Golang wraps it in such a way that you don't need to worry about that with your concurrency pattern and uh, no local stacks in your Go routines. But internally, it will do the same scheduling on the OS threads which has a shared memory. Right? Even when I say we are conceptually thinking that we are passing by values between the Go routines, right? But, uh, uh, but the, uh, the implementation of Golang can decide to use actually pass by references, right? Because thread has the shared memory. So there is a much leverage for uh, 
the programming uh, as such, but we don't need to worry about that because we think in an abstract level, saying that okay, it's all possible value, and you just have good routines, and you don't need to worry about threads and their, you know, uh, memory uh, safety and all that, right? So this is more or less what uh, Golang does under the hood, right? And you have you just worry about go routines, and then you uh, um, play on only at the go routine level with channels for your uh, in intercommunication, right? Just, just one point that Golang does not have a new Right, and that is what the scheduling does. It, yeah, it, it does that. Yeah. I'm sorry, garbage collection. Mm -hmm. Memory management, yes. Okay. Sorry? In this case, No, but we can control by giving uh, no options when you start the Go program, right? You can say how many threads you want to do what. You can control that by VM option, options. And Erlang, what Erlang does? Erlang is VM, right? It uses uh, no, Beam VM, the default. A lang virtual machine and it has been went multiple iterations, right? This is the latest iteration. In that latest iteration, what it does is right. So it actually also suggests that use you no know, as many OS threads, you no know, configure it in such a way that you have as many OS threads as your cores. That because that is the minimal uh, panel uh, as per the CPU content, that is the minimal thing that can finally happen. But uh, Beam is pretty uh, no, nuanced in a way that every OS thread will have more than one. Scheduler, right? Scheduler is what they call as more. You can think of scheduler as like green threads. What it means is Erlang VM takes care of even having more, uh, say, one, 24 or 36 schedulers per thread. So there is one more level of concurrency built in there. So uh, there is an upgrade. So there are schedulers per thread, and the schedulers will actually span all these processes across those scheduling. So you will have a better uh, usage or better. Uh, I would say like you have not just at grid level, but you'll also have more concurrency. Of course, it's all uh, at the end of the day, OS threads has to execute them. But uh, the way that they implemented is by having a schedule or one more level in between the OS threads and also the processes which actually get scheduled. Well, so okay, oh, green threads, right? What are green threads? So you have a virtual machine and then you don't want to use operating. Threads. Why? Because they are heavy and they actually consume a lot of memory. It will allocate a lot of memory, big stacks. Like we don't have 4 KV stacks, like how do we have for processes, right? So green threads is actually an implementation of your scheduler, right? And they, uh, in Erlang context, they don't say this scheduler also has a thread. Actually, it's a thread. And it is created in a virtual machine and it is completely controlled by a virtual machine, which is technically a green thread, right? But they don't call it as a green thread and they call it as a scheduler because that main responsibility, the work that it is doing is only scheduling. Right. It has go routines and it has to manage those go routines and it has to you know, schedule it based upon whenever something gets interrupted, it needs to find the next go routine and execute it. Right. So you can think of the scheduler as more or less like a green thread implementation in your, you know, multiple, in Java I think they did the green threads, but yeah. We are confusing both versions. I mean, yeah, I am very sure that this kind of, you know, even I am trying to learn and get better understanding of all these things connected right? because there is so much that goes into uh, getting a right schedule and Go also has, you know, trying to improve their scheduling, uh, you know, uh, efficiency and they are trying to get more ideas in place to make it more efficient and all that. That's not the
Hog the resources in the sense you don't need to release it, then yes. No matter what you do, you're out <laughs> for a fix of time, and that's it. Fail. <laughs> fail on the yeah, moment you see something, fail. Handling an error in Golang is bad. Is, is, no, no, handling error in Golang is bad. Oh, in Golang, yeah. Handling error in Golang is. Uh, you should not do. <laughs> Let the supervisor take care of all that. Yes, <laughs> you just fail. <laughs> yeah, so that's all uh, more or less I had, and I'm uh, out of time, over time, and all that. So. I'll leave you guys and thanks a lot. Oh. Yeah. So now your contention problem is not your process which is actually sending the data, but the line, the neural network speed. Now that gets into the control for your example, right? No matter what you are, no how much you multiplex here, right? But still it has to go in the network, and the network limit is what stops, decides the speed. Right? So that uh, maybe if you, this same example that you said, if you think between two uh, processes or between two different neural things, right? Or that way maybe yes, you can actually literally leave them and send it in the buffer channel and take it out. So the pushing layer can be done in the Yes. For the scale of the one. Right. Yeah, but meaning you can easily con connect to some other process which is running in a different machine or in a whole network and then you just communicate with the as needed to communicate with the local process. Right. Well, especially if you have a different way,